We are privileged to have the Reverend Ralph Sir Marco uh, with us this morning. Uh, Re Ralph, I knew I would say that, and I did. <laughs> His first name is not Ralph, it's Sal. Reverend Sal Sir Marco. Whatever you want to call him. Well, we'll, we'll call you Reverend Sal. Reverend Sal, uh, Reverend Sal is, a, is a Princeton graduate. He is current, currently a hospice cha chaplain with Hospice of New Jersey. Uh, and uh, he uh, is also black belt in karate, mm -hmm. Korean karate. So don't don't let the clerical guard fool you. Uh, but uh, we, we're uh, welcome to Grace Pres Presbyterian Church. We are privileged to have you here with us this morning. Would you join? Our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of John, the first chapter through verse 18. This is the prologue. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things that came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, a glory as the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he whom I said, He who comes after me rakes ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one ever has ever seen God. It is God, the only son, who is close to the father's heart, who has made him known. Here ends the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing unto you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer, that these words become yours and find a place in the heart of this congregation. Amen. So happy new year. It's, uh, it's nice to be with you. I've known uh, Pastor Robin for a couple of years now. We've sat on a couple of presbytery uh, committees together. Uh, so thank you to, to Robin and to you for welcoming me into your pulpit. Uh, if something is goes amiss or you don't like my preaching, just blame the guest preacher. That's <laughs> always my go-to. Um, but more importantly, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes, Christmas is not over yet. How many people know that the 12 days of Christmas are from Christmas Day to Epiphany? Good, some people know. Uh, don't let the family channel fool you. The 12 days of Christmas are not the days leading up to Christmas. I always like to remind people when I preach after Christmas uh, about that. So our gospel reading today is the prologue. It's usually not thought of as a Christmas um, well, it's a Christmas reading, but it's really not thought of as a nativity reading. Usually when we think of Christmas morning and the birth of Jesus, we think of Matthew and Luke. You know, those two stories that make up whatever we see in our mind or in movies. Um, there's a great movie called The Nativity, came out a couple of years ago, that uses those two scriptures as a great job of illustrating what's in the book. But this gospel is John's version of a nativity story. It's God coming into the world in Jesus. 
And I have to admit, Jesus, uh, John is probably my favorite book to preach. Uh, I use it for every funeral I do. Uh, I've lost count at this point how many I've done, but I love John. But John is kind of complex. It's very philosophical. Uh, it's kind of heady. But what does the beginning of this story remind you of? In the beginning, it makes you think of Genesis, the beginning of creation. And that's kind of the point. John wants to announce that God in Christ was there at the beginning, is there now, and forever will be. God chose to be in creation. And Jesus' role in that creation is secured in this passage. And then God is brought into the world, made flesh. The threefold claim, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, reveals this is John's nativity. This is his revealing of the relationship of Jesus, his origin, and his relationship with God, and his identity as God. These truths about Jesus are inseparable and essential to John's portrait of Jesus. And what the incarnation means and describes our own humanity. Why is the light shining in the darkness a Christmas story? Why is the incarnation of Jesus here important, especially at Christmas? You know, we normally think of Christmas as the, the happy baby Jesus. Look at the baby Jesus born in this little nativity. Uh, the silent night, I can guarantee you that was not a silent night. Um, if you have children, um, I have a two year old, almost two year old, and another on the way, I can guarantee you. After a 30 hour labor, my wife was not being quiet that night. But the incarnation of God is represented as light coming into the darkness, just like in Genesis, when God says, let there be light. God's coming into the world in Jesus has overcome the darkness. We've been through some darkness the last two years. I believe it's all, almost two years that we've been through this pandemic. I'm tired of wearing a mask. Every day as a healthcare worker, I'm tired of wearing a mask. We've been through some dark nights, but the light came into the darkness and the darkness cannot, will not, and has not overtaken the light. And it's always fitting that Christmas falls around the longest night, the Yule uh, celebration. It's a very hard time of year, but the light came into the world and the darkness cannot overtake it. So we celebrate that the light came into the world. And then we see John. Normally we see John as the Baptist, John the Baptist. Uh, here, John, the author of John, who isn't John the Baptist, by the way. John the Baptist did not write this, this uh, gospel. <clears throat> Normally we refer to John the Baptist as John the Baptist, but here John refers to him as John who came to witness and testify to the light. So normally in the other gospels, John is there to baptize, to prepare people for the coming of Jesus. But here he comes to witness, to give light to the light. 
He testifies on the character of God. Um, we all have character. And that character is testified to by our actions, but it's also, you know, our loved ones can testify to our character. Um, I'll let my wife not testify about my character along with the pulpit, but we can test, we can give light to character by how others receive us. And that's important about John testifying to the light because it's setting up for what we as disciples are to do. What is our role? Who knows the song, this little light of mine? What are we gonna do? Let it shine. So by John being the first one to testify to the light, sets us up for our job. What does God, what does Jesus tell, tell us to do at the end of the gospels? Go therefore, make disciples. How do we make disciples? We take the light from under the bushel and let it shine. So we speak to the character of God by proclaiming Jesus. So Christmas is, yes, a time to celebrate the fact that Jesus was born, became incarnate through Mary, became a living human being. But what's the other theme of Christmas? Kind of links up with Easter, foreshadows Easter. Yes, we wait every year for Christmas to Jesus to be born. But when we take communion, what do we say? We wait for God and Jesus to come again. So Jesus, Christmas is not a past event. It's a future event. It's really both. It's a yes, but not yet. So why are we testifying to the light? Because the light came and it will come again. You know, it takes time for light to reach a destination, right? You think about stars. By the time we see the light of a star, the star is actually gone. But light travels. If that's a, I don't wanna to be too sciencey, but that's the way to think of it. The light came and it will come again. So this Jesus as a baby, it's easy to think of Christmas as the cute, cuddly baby Jesus. If you've seen uh, the movie by Will Ferrell, The, the Ballad of Ricky Bobby, uh, he says at the dinner table he'd rather prefer to pray to the baby Jesus because baby Jesus is cute and cuddly. Uh, adult Jesus, not so much. Because what does adult Jesus do? Flips over tables and actually expects, expects us to act like his followers. But it's important to view the incarnation of God as a baby because we start as babies. It connects us to our humanness. But it also reminds us that with God, just like we have a relationship with our parents, we have a relationship with God, that parent-child relationship that <clears throat> regardless of what happens, everything we need from our parents, everything that my son Calvin needs from me as a dad and my wife as a mother and receives from us love, encouragement, nourishment, protection comes from God. So I'm providing it for my son, but those things were given to me from God. So the promise of Christmas is that Jesus reminds us in the manger that we are his children. Just as his son came to us at Christmas, he came at Christmas to connect us that we also are God's children. So Jesus, the word became flesh. And that's the most clearly the most theological connection of the 
promises of John, God becomes human. And as the NRSV says, lived among us. But the actual root verb in Greek means to tent. God sets up tent, a tabernacle. He dwelt among us. It can also mean to say took up residence. So has anyone read the, the message translation by Eugene Peterson, the uh, Presbyterian pastor? He translate maybe more accurately transla translates it that Jesus, God, moved into the neighborhood. That's the funny thing. God always moves into the neighborhood. And sometimes moves into the neighborhoods we don't think he should. <laughs> But he does. This is as much about who God is, what God is about, and to what and whom God is committed. And it's a declaration of what the word of God is. God is committed to us. The theme throughout John's gospel is that God promises, he promises to be with his people. And that's the message I always preach when I preach on John at funerals. God continues to be with his people. Dwelling, the, the dwelling of God with us is very intimate and personal. But the word became flesh and dwell and is dwelling among us. And now God not only sees where God's people go, but is who they are. God now dwells with us by taking on our form, our humanity. This dwelling, this different dwelling of God is God being where God's people are. And now who God's people are. God is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. And then from his fullness, it's complete. Grace upon grace. One of my favorite passages that brought me through my life a couple years ago, as I was becoming a training to be a chaplain, I got divorced. That process of healing, what got me through that is from Romans chapter five, where sin abounds, grace abounds evermore. So that is the story of Christmas, where sin abounded, grace abounded evermore. Truth. Christ is truth. Truth came into the world. It reveals what God's grace looks like. God's grace looks like a baby born in a stinky room full of animals to become the grown adult who flips over tables and takes on our brokenness and our sinfulness. God's grace looks like Jesus. So it's a very intimate look at Christmas. So with our with our other stories of Christmas, yeah, we see the history of Jesus. We see his lineage. We see the historical context of Jesus coming into the world. So Jesus comes in and shines a light into our darkness. I think that's the, the point I want us to remember as we start year two of this I almost said some nasty words about the pandemic. This junk that we want to be done with. But remember, the light has come into the world and no amount of pandemic or darkness can snuff that light. Um, wherever darkness is, grace, is there. Wherever darkness is, love is there. 
Wherever hatred is, love is there. For all of the nastiness that we've seen the last two years and on the news and um, Facebook, what has been a constant? Love, grace, truth. You look at the, the, the passion and the work of our frontline workers, the doctors, the nurses, the chaplains, the social workers, those, the scientists with the vaccine, people who are in the darkness trying to let the light shine through. <clears throat> so that's our job at Christmas, is to remind people that while it, we're in the darkness, Maybe, just maybe, the light of Christ can shine through us. Maybe. I love Rich Mullins. He says, be good, but you probably won't be. So be God's. This is our proclamation this Christmas, that we are all God's, God's children. So we need, especially now, we need to let the light of Christ shine through us. How do we do that? By love. Love and truth and grace. Grace upon grace upon grace. And remember that rebellions are built on hope. On hope. Our hope comes from the Christmas story. Our hope comes from the Christmas story that Christmas is not the end. Jesus came into the world and he's coming back. He's coming back. So uh, don't let the Christmas spirit end December 26th because it doesn't. Liturgically, it doesn't. But the Christmas spirit gets us to Easter. So that's my hope for you today, to let the light of Christmas shine through you for the rest of the year until we get to Easter. Amen. Amen.